morning and welcome to Sunrise Cancer at Pasadena. Uh, we're going to begin something a little bit different today uh, in our time together. Uh, it's Monday, November the 2nd, and we're going to begin looking at the Petrine epistles this week and next. And maybe we'll get into a little bit of uh, uh, the Johannine epistles. So uh, I hope you'll enjoy these uh, these videos. I also am changing the format just a little bit. I'm going to do Bible study, direct Bible study on five days of the week, Monday through Friday. And then on Saturday, I'm going to take a little time to give you a preview of what you can be looking for uh, in uh, worship, whether you're watching us online or whether you are actually in person uh, with us. Uh, we'll do that every Saturday going forward. So let's talk about 1 Peter for just a few minutes. Now, there's a question of authorship, who actually wrote uh, these, these epistles. It was not uncommon for some, some student or disciple or follower of some uh, great religious person or person who became great to write in their name. Uh, if Peter, in fact, did write uh, the Petrine epistles, um, and there's arguments why he probably wouldn't have been able to write so eloquently. I mean, uh, fishermen just didn't seem to have that gift. But then again, what's to say God didn't just give it to him? So who knows? I mean, the arguments go round and round and round about authorship. But if he did, he would have had to have written it sometime before uh, 64 AD. Now, References in this epistle, just like in the Revelation to uh, Babylon, are a reference to the Roman Empire. And you see this, of course, in uh, 1 Peter 5, 13, and, and I, we'll talk about Revelation when I do that study. What I want you to understand primarily about it not being, potentially not being Peter, is that the biggest persecution of the Christians took place later in the first century after after Peter and Paul and many others had been killed. Now, the word Peter comes from the Greek word Petros or Kephas, which um, means rock. And of course, Jesus had referred to Peter as the rock, the foundation upon which he would build his church. But these are some things to keep in mind anytime you have a discussion about Peter. Before his uh, ascension to heaven, Jesus restored Peter uh, for that uh, denial. Peter was the one who preached the great Pentecost sermon. Peter was the one who helped bring Samaritans and Gentiles together. He traveled just, just not as extensively as Paul did, and he was also martyred in Rome. Now, as we get into chapter one, I, there's some things about First Peter that I really need to make sure all of you understand about how it impacts our life of faith as United Methodist Christians. It is a great witness, uh, a great witness to our understanding of salvation. You can get a lot of a lot from our understanding of salvation by reading this. Our understanding of atonement and the holy life our understanding of hope and redemption and grace. A lot of the way we see things are found here in 1 Peter. So it's a very, very important book to the life of our faith. In chapter one, uh, Peter gets into, uh, begins with his uh, salutation. And then he begins in verse three to talk about the new birth and what that means. Um, he talks about probably one of the greatest phrases in Christianity he talks about an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept for you in heaven. That's in uh, verse four. Then he brings up the whole, in verse eight, the concept of a living hope, not a hope that is dead, but a hope that has, that, that has, is real. And, uh, and that grace has been the plan of the prophets in verse 10 Grace has been the plan of the prophets. It's been the proclamation all these years, and now it has come to fruition in Christ. Verses 13 to 25 are really a call to all Christians to live a holy life, to do so through obedience, through preparing ourselves, through being ready, and to conduct ourselves in holiness. 
That's the thing that a lot of us miss the mark on, I'm afraid. We need to remember that uh, as, as Christians, we are called to a, a higher purpose. We are called to try to live into a holiness way of life, both personally and socially. And that doesn't mean a form of government. Social holiness is, is corporate group holiness, where everyone is helping look out for one another. He talks about how we do all of this because we are in Christ and we're not to be of ourselves. That's in verse 17. Too many of us do what we do for ourselves and not for the glory of God. And First Peter's trying to say, give that another thought. He says in verse 25, the word of God endures forever. The word is the good news that was announced to you. And that good news continues to be announced to us today from sunrise to sunset.